So uh, believe it or not, the first half of this class is basically going to be a traditional lecture class. Uh, this material is fair game for the final exam. The good news is, is it primarily builds on things we've already done in this class. It might exercise them in new ways, but the concepts are effectively being recycled. So I'm going to squeeze a little bit of uh, nuclear physics into the lecture today. This will be thematically tied to some medicine as well, although I am not a medical doctor, as many of you have constantly pointed out to me. That's okay. There's still a lot that physics, chemistry, biology, and medicine can all learn from each other to help advance the human species. All right. So um, what I'm going to do first is I'm going to start with the definition of nuclear medicine. It is actually fairly specific. As I was putting this lecture together, I came to realize that it's important to make some distinctions here. So nuclear medicine is specifically the employment of radioactive materials, that is materials that are inherently unstable and will spontaneously radiate energy and in the process may change underlying nuclear form. Um, it's the use of such materials in the diagnosis and treatment of disease. And you can think of it as the application of nuclear and particle physics from the inside of the patient to the outside of the patient. Um, accelerator medicine, on the other hand, is an example of the case where you use a, a beam of particles, for instance, to go into a patient to do treatment from the outside to the inside without actually having to cut them open. Nuclear medicine is a little bit more invasive. Um, it does involve getting things into the body first that may need to come out later or may come out on their own. And we'll talk about that a little bit at the end of the lecture. So some examples of this that you might have heard before are brachytherapy. So this is the introduction of small, what are called seeds. They contain radioisotopes, so again, unstable atomic elements. You implant them, so there's surgery involved. It may not be too invasive, but it is nonetheless surgery. It carries a risk. You implant them in a region of undesirable tissue. So a classic example of this would be cancerous growth. So if a person has tumors and they're malignant and they need to be shrunk or destroyed, implanting a radioactive seed in or near the tumor material to attempt to kill it over the other healthy tissue is a strategy. Um, so you use that emitted radiation to damage the tissue in the immediate, immediate region of the seed. And then later on, you, you may have to remove the seed, assuming that it isn't destroyed by the body or flushed by the body safely in some other way. Now, what I'm going to focus on today, because thematically, there's a lot that's the same between implanting a radioisotope and what you do in the case of a PET scan. I'm going to use the PET scan as kind of my all-encompassing walkthrough example today of nuclear medicine. This involves, first, injecting, so slightly less invasive than a surgery, injecting a radioisotope into the bloodstream of the patient. That then is taken up by specific tissues. And again, one obvious place where this might be interesting would be cancerous tissues, though it's not necessarily limited only to those things, as you'll see later. Um, wherever that radioisotope collects in the body, so the body will distribute it, tissue will take it up. Uh, it's the radioisotope is deployed chemically in a way so that it's readily taken up by the target tissues in the body. Um, and then you wait, and that isotope will decay over time, and radiation will be emitted. And if you're lucky, it will penetrate out of the body, and it can be captured by some device around the body. And from that capture process, working out the geometry and everything, you can then try to form an image of the patient's sort of spatial location of the radioisotope from the emitted radiation. And the specific process I'm going to focus on today is what is known as positron emission tomography. Okay, so in this lecture, I'm going to review first the history and nature of radioactivity. I'm going to dig into the nucleus and go into some of the details of the PET scan. Again, positron emission tomography, we'll break that, word, that phrase down. Now, the physics that's involved here really does neatly apply also to things like brachytherapy, because again, the idea is the same. You're gonna to try to get an isotope into a patient for some purpose. For a PET scan, the purpose is to image the patient. For brachytherapy, it's to intentionally destroy tissue, ideally in the vicinity of the, of the implant, the seed. But the core idea is the same, unstable nuclear isotope inside a human body. We'll look at radioactive decay. 
uh, and the interaction of emitted radiation with the body because that has some implications, both good and bad for the patient. Okay, so let me begin with a brief history of radioactivity. And I am really cherry picking my way through history across just a few key moments. So you can probably credit the discovery of what we would now think of as radiation, that is spontaneous emission of high energy particles from a system uh, to this fellow right here. And you've seen him before in an earlier lecture in the class. This is Wilhelm Röntgen, lived from 1845 to 1923. So you see his life neatly encapsulates that really radical period of transformation from the completion of the laws of thermodynamics and electromagnetism to special relativity and the resolving of the paradoxes between electromagnetism and classical mechanics into the quantum mechanical era. And he was a part of that force of people that ushered in the quantum era. Now he serendipitously discovered X-rays in 1895. So uh, quite late in his uh, life and career while experimenting with cathode rays. So cathode rays, just to remind you, are the emanations that come off of a metal when you either heat it or put it under a high voltage. And in that case, we now know you strip electrons off the metal, okay? And those electrons will travel accelerated through the electric field that the metal is exposed to. Um, and they can do all kinds of things. If there's gas in the electric field, they can cause the gas to give off light. Um, a cathode ray tube classically will give you a sort of greenish blue colored beam. That's the electrons exciting the molecules in the gas. But that beam has to end somewhere and it will crash often into material at the other end of the cathode ray tube. Uh, and, and that collision, that interaction with other material in the tube will actually cause X-rays to be produced. And that's how they were discovered. They were discovered somewhat serendipitously and accidentally by Rentgen when he inadvertently exposed uh, a sensitive photographic system to X-rays, not knowing X-rays were coming off the system and being curious why it caused uh, his uh, photographic emulsions basically to become exposed as if they had been exposed to daylight. Um, now this is um, following on that discovery that there's a new emanation coming off of cathode ray tubes caused by the collision of the cathode rays with material in the tube uh, and the fact that it will cause a film to expose, he hit on the idea that if these rays are penetrating, which he found out that they were, you could take a human hand and you could put the hand between the beam of X-rays and the emulsion. And so this is actually Anna Ludwig, R Rentgen's wife. It's her hand. Um, that is not a tumor that you see there, this thing here, right here. I'll come back to that in a second. That's not a tumor or a bone growth. Um, but you can see this is the world's first medical x-ray. He imaged the internal structure of his wife's hand non-invasively using the newly discovered x-rays, which he serendipitously discovered. So this is the world's first medical x-ray. And that blob of material on her hand, it, it's her ring. So the ring, just like the bone in the body, is the dense material. And it will preferentially prevent x-rays from getting through whereas the soft tissues allow the x-rays through fairly readily. We'll talk more about that later, okay? So um, the x-rays were sourced from the cathode ray tube. Um, I've already explained that process. Um, that's an artificial way of making x-rays. So Rentgen discovered x-rays by artificially making them. But Henri Becquerel would go on to find out that that same radiation, x-rays, can be emitted naturally by uranium salts. Um, it was naturally occurring uh, fo high energy photon radiation, very similar to what Rentgen discovered. But unlike the cathode ray tube, it required no external input of energy. It happened spontaneously on its own. And you can see here, um, these experiments with uranium salts would have also marked the first moment that human beings realized that there is a power within the atom that's just there for the taking if you can harness it. Now, at this point, it's random. The uranium salts spontaneously emit the radiation. There seem to be no way to induce it to do that more, no changes in temperature, humidity, uh, changing the electric field that the material was exposed to. Lots of experiments were conducted on these to try to induce more of this spontaneous decay. And it was impervious to those kinds of environmental changes. And we'll see later exactly why that is, although I'm sure many of you are already familiar with the fact that What's going on here is a process inside the nucleus that isn't influenced by these factors. 
Now, another major step here was uh, the work first by Marie Curie uh, and then by her husband, Pierre Curie, to really dig into what's going on in these naturally occurring radioactive materials. So she observed that materials like pitch blend and toberonite were much more radioactive than uranium on its own. And based on this, she was able to infer that these materials contain something in addition to what was just in uranium that itself was even more radioactive than uranium, more likely to spontaneously emit radiation. Pierre was so fascinated by the work that Marie was doing that he actually dropped his work on the research into crystals and crystal structure to become her collaborator. Um, this would have been in the late 1800s. Uh, they would then go on to discover new elements, which were called radium, uh, given its highly radioactive nature, and polonium in honor of Marie Curie's home nation of Poland. Uh, and based on all of this work, she would go on to develop the very first theory of radiation. Now, fascinatingly enough, um, she would also then be the first female scientist ever to win a Nobel Prize, the first to win a second Nobel Prize, and to date, she's the only person who's ever won two Nobel Prizes in two completely different categories. She won for physics in 1903 and chemistry in 1911. Um, Pierre died in 1906. He was uh, struck in an accident on a roadway and, and killed in 1906. Uh, so she continued to work uh, in a lab in Paris. It, it became known as the Radium Institute and later the Pierre and Marie Curie Institute. I had the pleasure of visiting it. Uh, it's very close to a place where uh, I like to occasionally vacation in Paris if I can get there. And it's really neat. You can go in, you can visit the Radium Institute, you can see her office uh, preserved effectively as it was at the time that she was the director of the Institute. It's really, really quite fascinating. Um, so let's talk about different kinds of radiation. So there are some scenes from moments in history uh, of the, the discovery of radiation, radioactivity, and the understanding of its, of its underlying causes. There are many more people that were involved in this than the ones I just men mentioned, but I'm kind of fascinated by the people I cherry picked for today. Uh, there are three known kinds of radiation that's emitted from atoms. Uh, one is called alpha, another is called beta, and the third is called gamma, in honor of alpha, beta, and gamma, the first three letters of the Greek alphabet. Now, alpha radiation was later understood to be helium nuclei that are wholly ejected from an unstable atomic nucleus. They have a plus two elementary charge, so they're highly ionizing when they pass through material, but their strength is also their weakness, because while they can do a lot of ionization as they go through a material, which for bio biological tissue means they can do a lot of damage, um, they're also very short ranged. They tend to interact too much and they stop very quickly, and they can actually be stopped by soft tissue, your skin, even the outer, just the outer layers of your skin can stop alpha radiation, uh, thin paper, things like that can stop alpha radiation. Beta radiation, on the other hand, uh, later was understood to be high speed electrons that are ejected from the nucleus. And beta radiation is what we're gonna spend a lot of time looking at today. Uh, it turns out they result, as we learned much later, from nuclear interactions induced by a, a new force in nature, not electromagnetism, not gravity, but a third force that works really only on ranges of the size of the nucleus of the atom, so about a femtometer. And it causes, a, for instance, a neutron to spontaneously convert into a proton emitting an electron and a little cousin of the electron called the neutrino in the process. I'll come back to neutrinos in a little bit. Now, beta rays, uh, as they were known early on, now we know that they're just very fast electrons. They are harder to stop, but they can be stopped by thin metal. They tend to punch through less dense materials. And then finally, there's gamma radiation. Uh, these are high energy photons. We understand that well now and have understood that well since the early part of the 20th century. And uh, we know now from understanding more about the structure of the nucleus that just like an atom can have excited states, a nucleus is just like a binding of nucleons and the nucleons can have excited states. So these photons get emitted whenever a nucleon, a neutron or a proton inside the nucleus of the atom will drop from an excited state to a lower allowed nuclear bound state. Or if you capture a nucleon, a photon can be emitted in the process. Just like if an atom captures an electron, it can emit a photon in the process. So nuclear physics and atomic physics have a lot in common from the quantum bound state perspective, 
but the force that does the capturing in the nucleus is far stronger, albeit short ranged, compared to the electromagnetic or Coulomb force that's responsible for the structure of the atom. Now, gamma rays typically have energies in the millions of electron volts uh, scale. Uh, they can penetrate many centimeters, even into dense material. And I'll come back to that point later. In human flesh, um, half of all gamma rays emitted from inside your body will tend to get absorbed every few centimeters. So if you start with 100 gamma rays, about four to seven centimeters later, you'll have 50. Four to seven centimeters later, and you'll, you'll be down to 25. So um, if you have a lot of tissue in the way of a gamma ray, you might have to take that into account if you're using gamma rays to do imaging of the interior of the human body that can be absorbed even by soft tissue. And if you don't take that fact into account, it can deteriorate your ability to build reliable images of the interior structures of the human body. I'll come back to that point later. All right, but alpha, beta, and gamma, we're gonna focus on beta and gamma today. Now, uh, the advent of the nuclear age really also ushered in the advent of the age of nuclear medicine. This is no accident. Once you build industrial infrastructure for weapons making and you no longer need to build weapons for war, that infrastructure looks for other ways to be used. This is a common theme in human uh, experience. It was certainly true of the steam age, then the industrial revolution, and it was no less true of the nuclear age of industrialization, medicine, science, and government. So uh, what drove the nuclear age, as we understand it now, of course, was the race among several powers, uh, the uh, uh, Germany, the Nazi Germany in Europe, the United Kingdom, uh, Britain, the United States and Japan all had programs to attempt to rapidly construct the first atomic weapons once it was realized after the study of quantum mechanics that it was perhaps relatively straightforward to create an artificial atomic blast. All you had to do was engineer the thing uh, if that was possible, then you could build a weapon relatively easily. Uh, the race to build these atomic weapons, which was done essentially in a bid by all powers to bring World War II to a rapid close for whoever's side got one first, led to a massive industrial nuclear capability. All right, so whole, the, many of the national laboratories the United States has today, uh, the Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory on the West Coast, the Los Alamos National Laboratory in the Southwest, the Oak Ridge National Laboratory in Tennessee, closer to the East Coast in the South, um, those were created to facilitate the production or design of weapons of war during and after World War II. Uh, Argonne National Lab near Chicago is another example of a, of a weapons lab that was constructed for this purpose. Um, the goal here was to, to be able to create artificial isotopes, that is to create uranium and also the much more potent plutonium uh, and to generate these artificially in high quantities uh, and to deliver those for the production of nuclear weapons. So the original way that this was done was to enrich existing uh, isotopes that you could dig out of the ground. So you uh, mine uranium. Mining uranium was the first capability, getting your hands on uranium stores. Then to refine that, you, um, you can uh, chemically separate the uranium from other elements in the rock. And now what you can do is you can enrich using various methods to get the uranium up to high purity. That's how you enrich uranium. There are gas methods and there are accelerator-based methods for doing that enrichment. Plutonium, on the other hand, is so unstable that you don't find it really naturally occurring in the Earth. You have to make it. And the way you make it is by bringing a lot of uranium together in the same place. The, the splitting of the uranium nucleus spontaneously will release three neutrons. The three neutrons will then hit other nuclei nearby and fission them in the process, which releases three neutrons per fission. And as I said in an earlier lecture on relativity, energy, momentum, and mass, this leads within 20 to 30 generations of the fission process to an uncontrolled explosion capable of leveling a city or a city center. Um, the, you're slowing the process down by moderating the neutrons getting out of each fission reaction will allow you to breed isotopes without having a runaway chain reaction. So what you do is you build a reactor like the one depicted here on the right, you take slugs of uranium and you plug those slugs into uh, regularly arranged holes in the side of the reactor complex. And every regular period of time, you push new slugs into the holes. That then takes the old slugs and moves them further down the tube. And you regularly industrially move the slugs down the tube by putting new ones in one end and then at the other end of the reactor, after a fixed amount of time, the first slug will pop out the end of the production line. And you time this so that you enrich in the useful 
isotope of plutonium without getting another isotope of plutonium that actually poisons the nuclear reaction and prevents a bomb from being made. This is a whole fascinating subject in and of itself, but you can see how this kind of industrial bomb making um, uh, effort would have to then be converted in a post-war age. And one of the ways that uh, places like Oak Ridge National Laboratories kept itself going afterward was peacetime nuclear applications. So post-war, this production was bent toward things like making isotopes for nuclear medicine um, or doing peacetime nuclear reactor for power generation. So there are many ways that these labs were bent to other purposes after World War II. Some of them remained building hydrogen bombs or atomic bombs. Uh, others were turned toward peacetime applications. Okay. So uh, let's talk about some nuclear physics now before we get into the PET scan. Um, first of all, uh, I've talked about one way to artificially produce and enrich in certain uh, target isotopes. You could take a naturally occurring isotope, chemically enrich it, put it into a unit, and then use it to generate other isotopes through its own fission process. Uh, another way you can do this in a more controlled means is to use a particle accelerator to do it. And I'm going to focus on this because this is actually how medical isotopes used for the PET scan are produced. And the most common medical isotope used for the PET scan is fluorine 18. And that's denoted here by this nice symbol, uh, the uh, uh, superscript 18 next to the capital F uh, up there on the upper left. Okay. Now it's produced not in a reactor, but actually using a, um, an office-sized uh, particle accelerator, and you see that depicted over here on the right. This photograph over here on the right, which is taken from a textbook about this kind of nuclear medicine and technology, shows you one of these um, cyclotrons, a circular accelerator. You inject a beam of protons into the center of a region with strong electric and magnetic fields. They then circulate wider and wider orbits as they get to higher and higher kinetic energies, and then you um, shunt them off using a deflector or a target at one end of the, of the circular racetrack. And then at the other end where you extract the beam, you have a target. In this case, it would be water. Uh, and that target is where you're trying to make your isotope, in this case, fluorine 18. Um, so um, the goal here is to bring protons up to a design energy. And the energy is tuned so that the nucleus you're attempting to strike can be breached not enough to break it, but enough to fuse the proton into the nucleus and create an isotope of your design. And the target here is uh, oxygen-18 enriched water. Now, oxygen-18 is a stable isotope of oxygen-16, which is the most abundant isotope of oxygen. It has a 0.2% natural abundance, and you can make O18 enriched water um, and use that as the target. So the O18 has 18 nucleons. That's what the 18 means. Eight of those are protons. And the protons, of course, determine the chemistry, the binding properties of the atom. Fluorine 18 also has 18 nucleons, but nine of them are protons. You've got to get an extra proton into the O18 nucleus, and you've got to get a neutron out if you want it to be useful. So the protons from the beam, which have an energy of 6 million electron volts, that's the sweet spot for these accelerators for fluorine-18 production. They strike the O18 nuclei. They come close enough to be captured by the nucleus, but not destroy the nucleus in the process. And in that reaction in the nucleus, a neutron and gamma radiation are emitted. So you lose a neutron. The change of the nucleus settling down to its new ground state causes a gamma ray to be emitted, and you've got your fluorine-18. And uh, you can make usable medical amounts of this in just a couple of hours using one of these accelerators, which is remarkable. These have currents of about 150 microamps. So you can estimate how many protons per second that is on target, knowing the fundamental charge of the proton is one elementary charge. So you can calculate how many protons per second that is on target. And then using some nuclear physics, you can estimate how long it will take to make a medically useful sample of fluorine-18. And it's it's not long, and it has to be quick for a reason I'll tell you in a second. Now, uh, one thing I need to do before we go into uh, the PET scan is I need to tell you a little bit more about the building blocks of matter, and I need to tell you a little bit more about the forces of nature, because what happens next with the fluorine-18 nucleus can seem a little weird, but it's completely allowed by the known laws of physics, and especially because we know a lot about the basic fundamental building blocks of matter and the very few forces that are needed to bind them together to make absolutely everything that we experience every day here in the universe. 
Now, we focused a lot on the atom this semester. That's been our playground for the most part. We've teased the nucleus a little bit as we've done particle in a box and things like that. But we really need to dive into the nucleus and we really need to see what fundamentally is rattling around in that thing because it ain't neutrons and protons. Um, atoms are made from electrons in orbit around that tightly packed nucleus, all right? And that structure, the atom, is maintained by the electromagnetic force, okay? So really the atom, if you just look at it writ large, is an electron, a nucleus, and the electromagnetic force to bind it together. But nature doesn't only possess of those building blocks and that one force. We, of course, we know of gravity. But gravity is so weak on the scale of things the size of the atom, it plays really no role that we're aware of in the atom or anything smaller than that that we've been able to study to date. Now, matter uh, is not fundamentally neutrons, protons, and electrons. As far as we know, the electron is indivisible. We've been trying to break it for 50 years to see if it's made of anything else, and we haven't succeeded in doing so yet. So we know that it's whatever it's made from, those things are no bigger than about 10 to the negative 18 meters in size. That's as far as we've been able to probe down, basically. But the neutrons and protons are actually made of other things called quarks, and they're bound together by other forces, the most prominent of which is the strong nuclear force. The weak nuclear force is the impish destabilizer of the nucleus. The strong nuclear force is the guardian of stability in the nucleus. And so I like to think of them as kind of the siblings that don't get along. The strong force is always trying to maintain order and the weak force is, break, is causing chaos to spontaneously break out in the nucleus. And any of you who are science fiction fans of things like Babylon 5, these are the Vorlons versus the shadows, okay? Vying for control of the nucleus, all playing strong together on the scale of the nucleus. So, so far as we know, there are 12 fundamental building blocks of nature, six of them in a category called quarks and six of them in a category called leptons. Electrons are leptons. The muon is a lepton, and it's a heavy, unstable cousin of the electron. We, we met the muon earlier in the semester. It, they have an even heavier and even more unstable cousin called the tau. And then each of them has this little, almost no mass cousin called a neutrino. There's an electron neutrino, a muon neutrino, and a tau neutrino. And I like to think of them as the annoying little baby sibling that wants to follow you around everywhere and you just want to be left alone and hang out with your friends. That's kind of what the neutrino is. Whenever you basically make an electron, a muon, or a tau, you're kind of forced to bring your neutrino sibling along with you to conserve some fundamental things in nature. Protons and neutrons are not fundamental. They're made from quarks. And in pr principle, they're made from just two kinds of quarks, up and down, the lightest of the quark species. So protons are an up, up, down in triplet combination with each other, and neutrons are up, down, down in triplet combination. You see, they differ by only one kind of quark. Change an up to a down inside of a proton, and you make a neutron. It's no accident protons and neutrons have almost the same mass. It's guaranteed by the physics of the quarks and the strong nuclear force. Now, the forces, to the best of our knowledge, come in four kinds. Uh, gravity, electromagnetism, and the weak and strong nuclear forces, the impish destabilizer and the, and the purveyor of order, okay? Um, the latter two, these nuclear forces, are transmitted by short-ranged particles. They're short-ranged for different reasons. The weak force is transmitted by what are called weak bosons. They're like heavy, heavy, heavy cousins of the photon. They're very massive, so they can't live very long. And they're known as the W and the Z. And then the strong force is transmitted by the gluons. And there are eight gluons in nature, eight kinds of gluon. They're massless too, but they like to interact not only with themselves, but with quarks so much that they can only go about a femtometer before they get trapped in a strong bound state of nature, like a neutron or a proton. And those get packed into a nucleus. So it's no accident that the nucleus is about a femtometer in size. That's the typical range of the strong nuclear force. And it's no accident that nuclei sometimes can fall apart. That's the impish hand of the weak nuclear force and the weak bosons that transmit that force. And I'll come back to that in a bit, okay? So this is our periodic table of nature on the right. To the best of our knowledge, these are the things we have definitely established make up matter and forces in nature. There is much we don't know about the universe 
We don't know what makes up the other parts of the universe we don't understand. And maybe one of you will add those missing pieces to this new periodic table of the universe. Now, I should note that gravitation is not on this chart because gravitation is, de is described by the general theory of relativity, whereas the strong, weak forces and electromagnetism are described by relativity married with quantum uh, mechanics, quantum field theory. We've never been able to make gravity play nice with quantum field theory. We don't know if it's required, but we've never been able to achieve it. So we can't really put gravity on this table because it's not described by the same mathematics that describe all this stuff. That's a puzzle too, one which maybe one of you will solve someday too. Okay, so let's wrap up and talk about the PET scan. We're gonna synthesize all of this together and talk about the PET scan, and then I'm gonna turn things over to you for the rest of the class. So um, first of all, we got to get into a little bit of biology and chemistry and some radiology here. So let's go back to fluorine 18. So fluorine 18 is an unstable radioisotope of fluorine. It's half-life. That is the time it would take for half your sample to go away is just 110 minutes. You see the urgency of the particle accelerator problem you have to solve to make it. You can't take three days to make your fluorine 18. It'll be gone by then. Anything you made two days ago is basically gone. So you have to make this stuff within a couple of hours and transport it to the hospital that needs it. So you need everything to be close by. And these machines are expensive. Not every hospital can have one. So facilities may have to be centralized in states to do radioisotope production with rapid delivery to hospitals. And you can see how, for instance, in a pandemic, how supply lines like this could break down relatively fast, okay? So something to keep in mind if you're thinking about the sort of infrastructure required to maintain a medical establishment that relies on things like this to do diagnosis or treatment. Um, now, it's used in the production. You don't just take fluorine 18 and stick it in the human body. That's a really stupid thing to do. Instead, what you do is you make a molecule that the body can process and take up without risk. And the choice here is to manufacture that fluorine 18 from the water target where it's produced right into fluorodeoxyglucose, which is a kind of glucose. FDG is the short name for it. Um, that can be taken up just like glucose by cells that need it. Okay, and lots of cells need glucose to function. Okay, they need to metabolize that to produce energy to drive the cellular processes in the body. Now, a typical medical dose of the uh, FDG will represent a, a, a radiation dosage that's known in uh, units called sieverts. I'll get to a sievert in a second. The dose represented by a typical medical injection of this isotope into your bloodstream is 7.6 millisieverts of radiation exposure. Now, I've given you a context-free exposure number, so I'm gonna put this in context for you, okay? This, by the way, is a structural representation of the FDG molecule where one of the fluorines has been replaced with the F18 isotope, okay? All right, so what is a sievert? A sievert is the modern unit of radiation exposure, and what's nice about a sievert, as opposed to a becquerel, which is another unit of radiation exposure, is that sieverts take into account the biological impact of the radiation. A becquerel just tells you how many radiated particles are emitted per second, but it doesn't tell you the biological impact of each of those particles on flesh, bone, and other tissue. A sievert is a joule of radiation into a kilogram of human tissue calibrated to the level of biological damage that that dose can do. So here's some handy numbers. So for instance, if you're hanging out next to your family in close proximity while you're social distancing from everybody else, um, being around a person for about eight hours will give you 50 nanosieverts of radiation exposure. We are littered with unstable radioisotopes. That's the normal background radiation of everyday life. And it's not that much. So if you're next to a person for eight hours, you can expect to get 50 nanosieverts of radiation damage. Living within 50 miles of a nuclear power plant, and I guess breathing in the air that comes from that, will expose you to 90 nanosieverts of additional dosage per year, okay? Now, one fun unit that I'll come back to later in the class is the banana equivalent dose. So um, many of you may consume bananas. Bananas are a rich source of potassium, and unfortunately, some of that potassium in nature is, a, is an unstable radioisotope of potassium. 
And it's just chemically the same as its stable cousin. So it winds up in bananas and other things that have potassium in them. You get 98 nanosieverts from consuming one banana. And this is known as a BED or a banana equivalent dose of radiation. Okay, one banana a day is 98 nan nanosieverts of additional radiation exposure, or roughly about, you know, sitting next to two people for eight hours. Um, living within 50 miles of a coal-fired power plant for one year will give you 300 nanosieverts of radiation exposure. And if you're curious about why it's more dangerous to live within 50 miles of a coal-fired power plant than it is to live within 50 miles of a nuclear power plant, cycle back and ask me a question later. We'll talk about it. One set of dental x-rays, which may be a common experience for many of you annually, uh, or maybe every other year, is 5 to 10 microsieverts of radiation. Okay, so now we've upped to the next, you know, three orders of magnitude here. We're up to five to 10 microsieverts of exposure. One and a half to 1.7 millisieverts is the annual dose that flight attendants on airlines get. They actually get quite a bit of radiation uh, for a typical worker in the United States or anywhere in the world. Uh, the people who are most exposed to potential forms of radiation are, of course, power plant workers and nuclear power plants, but actually flight attendants are way up there. And this is why pilots and flight attendants have to have their doses closely monitored. It's why they wear radiation badges, and it's why they're not allowed to fly for more than so many hours per week. It's part of the reason why they're not allowed to fly for so many hours, more than a certain number of hours per week. A single full body CT scan, which is a whole body dose of, uh, of X-ray radiation, is 10 to 30 millisieverts, okay? So we're still in the realm of medical procedures here. A six month stay at the International Space Station will give you 80 millisieverts, roughly three times the equivalent of a single full body CT scan. A six month trip to Mars, which is what people are talking about doing, is try to get a, you know, a trip to Mars within a year or two for human passengers. That's gonna expose you to 250 millisieverts, mostly due to cosmic ray radiation, you're not protected by the Earth's magnetic field when you're between Earth and Mars. And Mars doesn't have a magnetic field to protect colonists. So this is a serious problem that anyone talking about colonizing Mars needs to solve. Maximum annual shallow depth skin dose allowed by occupational work and health standards in the US is 500 millisieverts. If you exceed that dose in an occupational environment in a year, you are supposed to be relieved of your duties that are exposing you to radiation for that year. Now it's not a lethal dose, but it's beginning to approach uncomfortable because it's halfway to one sievert. And one sievert is the maximum lifetime, lifetime dose allowed for NASA astronauts. At that dose level, you now have accumulated a 5.5% chance of developing a malignant cancer sometime in your lifetime. Okay, one sievert. Four to five sieverts has a 50% chance of killing you in 30 days. Okay, so the decay of fluorine-18 is interesting because when fluorine-18 decays, it returns back to that stable, rare isotope of oxygen, oxygen-18. And it primarily emits beta, beta radiation when it does this. Most of the time when it decays, it's emitting beta radiation, so fast electron things. Now let's think about what it means for fluorine-18 to be able to spontaneously decay to oxygen-18 while emitting beta radiation. So fluorine-18, as I said, has 18 nucleons, nine of which are protons. It's going to convert into oxygen-18, which has a slightly lower mass. It still has 18 nucleons, but it's got slightly less mass, and now it only has eight protons. Why does it have slightly less mass? This is one of the interesting details of nuclear physics. A nucleus is more than the sum of its parts. If you just blindly take the number of nucleons, 18, and multiply blindly by one atomic mass unit, so one AMU times 18, you will get wrong answers for the masses of nuclei because the binding energy of those nuclei becomes mass energy and makes the nucleus a little heavier, or if there's less binding energy, makes the nucleus a little lighter. Remember, E equals MC squared. Any more energy that goes into binding a nucleus together will increase its mass. If it relaxes the binding energy, if it takes less binding energy to hold the nucleus together, then its mass will be slightly lower. And nature takes advantage of these little differences. So in order to convert from fluorine-18 to oxygen-18, fluorine-18's gotta lose a proton while at the same time gaining a neutron to maintain that mass number of 18. 
So you can imagine what the reaction equation for this has got to look like. It's got to look something like this. A proton in fluorine 18 spontaneously converts into a neutron, okay? But in the process to conserve charge, it's got to emit something else. Well, the only radiation that it could emit that will conserve charge appropriately here is beta radiation. It has the right number of elementary charges to make this work out plus any other things X that might be emitted like a neutrino to conserve energy in the process among other things. So I have some questions for the class now and first to raise your hand, I'll, I'll take your, your answer. First of all, free protons don't spontaneously decay. If you just take a proton and you trap it, it will live forever. And in fact, we have done that experiment for decades now. And so far as we know, the lifetime of a stable of a free proton exceeds the lifetime of the, of the universe. So it's far in excess of 14 billion years. So free protons don't decay. Is that a problem here? So any hands on this one is, do you think this is a problem in this case that free protons do not spontaneously decay? That they are stable beyond the lifetime of the universe? Raise your hand if you have a thought as to why this is or isn't a problem. I mean, for instance, we know this isotope gets used for medical applications, it must work. Why might it work? Why might it decay this way? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So it ain't free. And remember, it's, it's made of other things, right. right? It's made of quarks bound together with gluons. And this thing's packed pretty uncomfortably closely to all the other nucleons. So the probability that they're acting like independent little billiard balls or spheres is, is pretty low. They're leaking into each other's territory, having little quark gluon reactions all the time in this messy suburb that they're packed into. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, they're not free. And so, so, you know, the all bets are off for the stability of the proton. So here's another question. What electric charge must the beta radiation have? It sounds right. like it could be a problem. Yeah. Yep. But, and the good news is this thing wouldn't happen if this fact weren't true about nature, that nature has both matter and its opposite antimatter. And that was predicted by uh, Paul Dirac in the 1920s. And within a couple of years after his prediction, which was effectively the basis of his PhD thesis, it was discovered. Uh, antimatter, in fact, the positron, the antimatter electron was discovered within two years of its prediction. And so suddenly it's like there's a whole other half of the universe you didn't even know existed. And Dirac was the first person to ever figure this out. And he was rewarded by being correct. Not all physicists are rewarded with being correct, but Dirac was lucky. So if this is an antimatter electron with the opposite charge of the electron, we're good. And in fact, it's that antimatter electron that comes out in the form of a fast moving beta ray that is the positron in positron emission tomography. So this answers the first question about PET scans. What is the P? And the P is positron, antimatter electron. So this reaction produces antimatter, which is kind of cool. So you can naturally get antimatter to be spontaneously produced through nuclear reactions like this. Okay. And I'm going to go more into that in a second. All right. Well, um, let's dig down into the decay of fluorine 18 and take a quark level view of what's going on. So as I said, protons are not really free in the nucleus. They're smashing into and invading each other's space all the time in the nucleus. So really it's quarks and gluons near the boundaries of the protons and neutrons that are kind of stickily overlapping with each other and interacting through gluons and things like that. So it's, it's going to happen that, you know, quarks are gonna have interactions with each other. And um, not only that, we know as you know, from this picture, protons are really neither fundamental nor point-like. They're spread out in space over about one femtometer or so of radius. Uh, they're built from quarks and gluons, so they're really messy. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, the weak nuclear interaction is the, is the guardian of instability. And it's impishly capable of taking, for instance, an up quark and spontaneously converting it to a down quark. So if you look over here at the right, this is a cartoonish and not very accurate depiction of a proton on the top. All right, so this is a proton up here. And down here, we have a neutron on the bottom. And they differ by only one quark kind. You take an up, you turn it into a down, and you go from being a proton to becoming a neutron. That's, that's it. That's the thin wall that separates a proton from a neutron is one spontaneous transformation 
of one of those up quarks. Well, sure enough, the weak force can do this, and it doesn't do it very often, but it does it enough to cause radioactive decay to occur. So viewed as a collection of quarks, it's not really a surprise that UUD might spontaneously through some interaction become UDD in, in a very short order. And in fact, the reaction equation is this. You have the, uh, one of the up quarks in the proton spontaneously converts into a down quark, making that bound state into a neutron, and in the process radiates off one of these weak bosons. Now this weak boson can't live very long. It's very heavy, it's very unstable. And so its mass energy actually converts into a positron and a neutrino. That's one of its allowed modes of decay. And uh, that's where your beta ray comes from. Your beta ray comes from the fact that the weak boson is like, you know, <laughs> I've changed an up into a down, a jokes on it. Less than a femtometer later, it spontaneously converts its mass energy into an electron, uh, a positron and a neutrino. Neutrinos have almost no mass and positrons have the same mass as the electron. So far as we know, all matter counterparts to antimatter have the same mass as one another, okay? So there's the positron and positron emission tomography. Okay, so uh, now positron being antimatter isn't gonna get very far because anytime antimatter meets its matter counterpart, anytime a positron meets an electron, they can fully convert their mass energy into other forms of energy, like kinetic energy for photons and things like that. So, you know, the positron might go for half a millimeter or a millimeter, but on average, it doesn't get more than about a couple of millimeters from the nucleus where it was produced, and it will smash into an atomic electron, and that is where you get the radiation that you ultimately detect in the tomographic scan. So, the positron emission leads to the production of gamma radiation, and it's the gamma radiation you detect outside the body. Um, so you get uh, you know, radiologically inert oxygen-18 from this process, and now you want to build a map of where FDG has been distributed within the body, where that glucose substitute is being metabolized. And so the positrons with the energies that are typical of this nuclear decay will only get maybe half a millimeter, one millimeter, max two millimeters away and even soft tissue from where they were produced. So your spatial resolution on the body at best is gonna be around a millimeter. That's the best you'll be able to determine where FDG is located in the body. So you still gotta detect it. So once the, the positron interacts with an atomic electron, imagine they have like a head-on collision like this or that the, the electron's at rest and the positron smashes into it. The mass energy of that interaction completely converts into kinetic energy for other particles or to make mass energy for other kinds of particles. And you, in this case, wind up with a reaction, matter, antimatter, that gives you a pair of gamma rays. And we actually looked at this process in the problem solving exercises for the lecture on energy, momentum, and mass in special relativity, okay? So you can dig back through the notes there and take a look at that to see that kind of collision process that we looked at. Now, annihilation of matter and antimatter means total conversion of mass energy into other general forms of energy. Could be momentum, could be mass for other particles. In this case, it's pure kinetic energy in the form of two gamma ray photons. In my opinion, matter-antimatter annihilation is nature's most perfect form of energy conversion. It's the holy grail of energy conversion. 100% conversion of mass energy into other forms of energy, which is why a matter-antimatter reactor sounds like a cool idea until you realize that the ratio of matter to antimatter in the universe is a billion matter particles for every one antimatter particle now you have a problem because you're not going to have a ready-made source of antimatter. You're going to have to make it yourself if you want to use it, okay? So this is a schematic of what happens. Um, uh, let me go into the detection process. You get these two photons. Imagine an FDG molecule has a fluorine uh, nucleus that spontaneously decays in the brain. That's one of the places that will take up glucose. The gamma ray photons will roughly come out back to back from this reaction to conserve momentum. And what you do is you put a ring of dense detector material around the body and you look for coincidental pairs of gamma rays striking the detector. You make the detector out of dense scintillating crystals with uh, optical mounting to tubes at the back that can detect light from the crystals. 
So the gamma radiation isn't visible to the eye. And most detector technologies are not capable of seeing a gamma ray directly. You've got to get the gamma ray to dump its energy into other forms of energy that you can detect. So the scintillator crystals are dense, but they're doped with a material so that when the gamma ray stops and ionizes a bunch of electrons out of atoms, the electrons will travel through the scintillator crystal and they'll cause the dopant to give off light. And that light will often be in the visible range. The photomultiplier tubes mounted to the back will take that visible light, they'll convert it into an electric current, and that's how you detect the gamma ray photons, by looking for coincidences in electric current in two different photomultiplier tubes. And then you track back along lines projecting through the body, and where they cross is the most likely place the gamma ray photons came from. That's the trick. That's how you make the three-dimensional map and you scan along the body to get a longitudinal perspective of where all the stuff is in the body. So you scan this ring of detectors down the body, and you do this slowly over about an hour or so, okay? Uh, photomultiplier tubes are a common technology for doing this. Uh, their modern version of these are what are known as a, a silicon photomultipliers, or SIPMs. They're very tiny. They be the size of a cell phone camera sensor. Uh, so you can make very small, compact photomultiplier devices these days. They're basically light bulbs in reverse. You put a current into a light bulb, you get light. A photomultiplier tube takes in light and it gives you back an electric current. So it's a light bulb in reverse, okay? So that's the basic idea here. You have an isotope, you inject it in the body. It's taken up by wherever the body takes up glucose and metabolizes it. You then wait a little bit till it spreads out in the body. Then you image along the long axis of the body over a period of time. Meanwhile, this radioisotope is declining in the body as it decays away. And if you do this all right, you can build a 3D map of where this FDG has been distributed to the body. And so here's an example uh, showing you an animation on the right in three dimensions, rotating a person along, around their long axis, showing you where FDG has been detected. This is a heat map, so red means lots of FDG. Yellow would mean less, and blue would mean almost none at all, okay? And uh, what you can see here, and let me pause this, is uh, we'll wait till they come around again here is there's a large mass in the body over here that is not supposed to be there, and that's evidence of uh, liver metastases of a colorectal tumor. So this is actually to detect, for instance, cancerous material that's very sugar and blood hungry, and basically this tells you FDG is in a place in the body where it's not supposed to be. You'll also notice that it's accumulated in the bladder. The body is capable of processing, removing, and excreting FDG. So this will naturally process the radioisotope out of your body. And you'll also notice it's accumulated up here in the brain as well, which, is, uh, which has a high uptake for glucose, okay? So this is, this is to give you the end result of nuclear medicine, okay? And what I want you to do for the rest of the class is just do some problem solving in nuclear medicine, all right? So I'll give you a little while to play around with this. The slide should be available on Canvas. And I'm gonna break you into your, your rooms and I just want you to, you know, work on, pick one of these questions and work on it. You don't have to work through them in any particular order. You could work on, um, you know, four instead of three, or you could, uh, well, I guess, you, I guess two, three, and four go together, but you can work on one and five without working on two, three, and four. I would do two, three, and four in order, unless you're going to go look up numbers for three and four to help support your calculations. Otherwise, you need to calculate the number from, from, from problem two, okay?